What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? It's Wednesday, the 28th of July. The joint is brought to you by Bowl and Branch. You're like, Joey, what's Bowl and Branch? There's nothing more important than a good night's sleep. Bowl and Branch knows it takes more than just a good mattress. You gotta have nice sheets. Bowl and Branch sheets are extra ultra soft. Plus, they're 100% organic and sustainably produced. Listen. These sheets are as comfortable as hell. It's like sleeping on a ball of cotton. I've had sheets before that are nice. I've been in nice hotels. Bowl and Brand are tremendous. The sheets are soft, smooth, and comfortable. I got my bed looking sharp with the new natural colored sheets. Check out the signature hem sheets. They're the best sellers for a good reason. They get softer with every wash. And here's something else that'll help you sleep. Bowl and Brand sheets are made by craftsmen who earn a fair living wage. These workers earn the pay and respect they deserve. Get ready for this, the Bowl and Branch guarantee. Enjoy any product worry-free for 30 nights. To experience the best sheets you've ever felt, choose Bowl and Branch. You can try them worry-free for 30 nights with free shipping and returns. You're looking for a gift for grandma, Uncle Pete, Uncle Joey, your sister, this is the way to go. The joint listeners get an exclusive 15% off your first set of sheets with promo code Joey at bowlandbranch.com. B O L L A N D B R A N C H period.com. That's Bowl and Branch. B O L L and Branch. B R A N C H.com. Promo code Joey, you're gonna love these sheets. You're gonna sleep like a baby, especially now that it's hot. These sheets will keep you nice and cool. Bowlingbranch.com. Pressing code Joey for 15% off. The joint is also brought to you by CBD Lion. The best CBD product on the market. How do I know? Because I've tried them all. This is it. Go to CBDLine.com. Read the third-party lab results and see what they have to offer. From the capsules to the CBD weed to the roll-on to the gummy bears, which are fucking tremendous. The new ones with melatonin are fucking sweet. You sleep like a baby. If you have an accident and take too many edibles, you pop a little CBD under your tongue and you're right back normal. Your heart will calm down a little bit and you'll be tip-top magoo with CBD line, extra strength, CBD lotions, roll-on, bath ball. If you want it, they make it. CBD line is at the top of their game. Go to cbdlion.com right now. Read, learn, pick something up to help you. Press in code Joey and get 20% off your order. Joey and get 20% off your order. Right now, go to cbdlion.com and press in Joey. Let's get this party started. It's Wednesday and I fucked up Monday. Let's do this. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? Welcome to Uncle Joey's Joint. Wednesday, the 28th of fucking July. We're almost done with this fucking month. And then it's another month and the summer's op- over. Then it's another month and the fucking Sopranos are here. So it's perfect. We want to keep these months fucking going. I'm sorry about Monday's podcast. I was a little fucked up when I taped it. I don't know what the fuck was the matter with me. Maybe I was a little retarded. I couldn't get the wording out of my mouth, but that's been going on lately. Some days I'm flat. Some days I'm Johnny Bananas. What are you going to fucking do? 
Uh, my teeth are back to fucking normal. I got them worked on on Monday. Only two stitches this time. It wasn't so bad. I did the fucking laughing gas, but not really. Not the weed laughing gas. Laughing gas, laughing gas from the fucking doctor. But it was terrible. I saw... Usually when you do fuck... I haven't done laughing gas since November 18th, 1987. The day I kidnapped Vela. And ever since that, I never did laughing gas again because it made me kidnap somebody. No, it didn't. <laughs> I kidnapped him on my own. Who the fuck are you kidding? That was the last time I did laughing gas, so I called the dentist last week, and I'm like, listen, that was traumatizing. All those fucking needles coming in. It was like fucking missiles. I can't do it again. I, I couldn't even go for blood that week. I was so traumatized by the needles, so they understood. They said, you got two options. You could take a fucking pill. We could give you a pill. Or you could take laughing gas. I said, give me the laughing gas. I went down there yesterday or Monday, and the laughing gas was fucking, uh, there was no fucking breathing thing. They put a little tube on my nose with two little things going in. I'm sitting up looking like fucking Miss Piggy. That's what I kept thinking of. I'm like, I'm like Miss Piggy. I'm sitting here, and nothing's fucking happening. Nothing was happening. I must have sucked on that fucking laughing gas for 15 minutes, and I said to him, can I go pee? Before you start, just to walk to see if I was like a little fucked up, nothing. So the laughing gas was like, whatever. Towards the end, I kind of felt it, but it was nothing. I just told him to dope me up good because the last time he just put cocaine on me and started fucking. I go, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. You got to put the coke on me and let it sit a little bit. Let it sit for eight minutes and then give me another fucking shellacking. Give me, put another coat on there and make sure you put something on the fucking roof of my mouth because I'm not going to tolerate that fucking needle again. That needle to the mouth fucked me up. My shoulders were tight. I couldn't move my fucking arms. I was done for two days. Never again will I stick a needle in the roof of my fucking mouth. Well, I didn't stick it in there. The doctor fucking stuck it in. But the bottom line is I'm better now. This afternoon, I got to go for a haircut, and I got to fucking go to the heart doctor to make sure that the gums being infected didn't affect my heart. Jesus Christ, this is what happens when you become a fucking old man. But the problem was I did eight caps in two weeks before I left, and the fucking thing got infected. My little Dracula fang got infected. You can see it's down now. He fucking cut it again yesterday. They had to cut the excess gums off. Can you fucking believe that? I didn't feel the stitches, but I tasted the blood going down my throat. It's a fucking nightmare. But guess what? It's over. I got to go back on August 9th now. No more fucking stitches. The heart feels a lot fucking better. Listen, I did coke for 28 years. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. I told my wife the other day, I go, listen, my heart is a fucking tank. First off, I grew up in North Bergen, the second hilliest city in the country. I walked up and down those fucking hills. That makes your heart stronger than fucking death. I hit the bag. You know, that makes your heart fucking strong. That makes that chest muscle fucking strong. I'm eating good. I'm sleeping good. You know, I'm not eating any fucking garbage food. My traps, listen, I had that. I think I did the shittiest fucking podcast I ever did on Monday. And all you motherfuckers told me was how good I looked. I can't believe it. So thank you. If I look that good, thank you. <laughs> but uh, I'm working out. I'm drinking tons of water. You got to remember, I work out four days a week. Every time I work out, I drink two fucking 50-ounce fucking glasses of water. I'm pissing all day. You understand me? There's times I leave the house. I piss before I leave, and by the time I hit the fucking nine, I got to pee again. I got to go behind a bagel shop with my little hospital pee. You don't think I have it in the car? I have it in the fucking car. There's tons of times I pee right at the fucking light. I will, I'm will. i so good at it now, I could take my dick out, put it on the cup, and pee right at the light, wave at people. How are you? Good to see you. Great Poupon. You got to see me at a fucking light, dog. I could piss up a storm, but at the next light, I got to empty the fucking piss out because I got to drive with one hand carrying the container because the container doesn't fit nowhere. And if that fucking thing spills in my car, my car is going to smell worse than what it does now. I have not washed that car since I've got it. I got that car in January, and it's had that piss bottle in it since I did the fucking surgery. I brought two bottles home. The one bottle's upstairs, which I never fucking use, and the other bottle's in my fucking car. You know, and it stinks to death. I remember going into the city to shoot that show, and I still remember pulling up to the fucking valet guy at the at the parking building, and he's like, where am I going to put your car? And he started walking away from me. I'm like, fuck, 
I got to pee. And I'm looking at him through the rear view mirror. I got my dick in the fucking hospital cup. And I'm fucking peeing, I'm peeing, I'm peeing. I see him turn around. I'm still fucking peeing. And by the time he got to the car, my dick was back in my pants. And I'm holding my pee. He thought it was like an iced tea. He didn't know what the fuck it was. <laughs> it's, it, he didn't see the container. But if you see my arm the way it was standing, you thought I would just had a nice tea in my hand. When he walked past me and he goes, park it over here. I go, hold on one second. And I got out of the fucking car. He didn't see me. And I emptied my pee in the garbage can. And I just hit it a couple times. Oh, yeah. I emptied it right in the fucking garbage can. You know me. I don't give a fuck. I put it back in my car. I got paper towels inside. I wipe the inside up. And I throw the fucking paper towels in the garbage. And that's it. But I'm not putting up with that shit. Listen, every time I get in that fucking car... I got to pee. And if I pull over in a parking lot and the cop sees me, I'm going to get fucking. If you pull over in a park or in one of those fucking truck stops and a cop sees you pissing, they're going to charge you with sexual assault. They're going to think you're showing your dick to a truck driver. And next thing you know, you're going to have to fucking register as a sex offender in your neighborhood. I can't have that. So I'd rather bear the shame and piss in that fucking container than take my dick out and become a fucking sex offender in my fucking neighborhood. I don't need that shit in my life. Nobody needs a sex offender in their fucking neighborhood. Anyway, today we got the honor of uh, interviewing one of my fucking close friends, uh, Rudy Sarzo. We're going to talk a little about Cuba. We've always talked about uh, music before, but today I wanted to switch it up. You know, Rudy was one of the first guys I went to lunch with, and he told me that he would never go back to Cuba while the fucking administration is there. And I was blown the fuck away because every other Cuban has gone back there. Thank God I have friends that are fucking headstrong. Rudy's like, I'm not going back there. And I always respect, like, at first it threw me off a little bit, but then I always respected him after that because I understood what he was saying. And I felt the same way after that. I'm like, fuck Cuba. He's right. I, what, did I forget? Do I have a short fucking memory? You know, they're fucking 90 miles from us, and they're fucking doing shit to people that it, it's just fucking horrible. I'm out. You know, I'm Cuban. It's in my heart. There's nothing I could do. You know, the last couple of weeks, I haven't felt good about this because I really want to help, and I don't know where to fucking start. But something will come to me, and eventually I could be a part of this fucking revolution and help the Cuban people. Anyway, uh, I got Rudy Sarzo for you. I'll check in with you afterward. Enjoy, cocksuckers. Go, go. What's up, beautiful? <laughs> que, que pasa, mano? Que pasa, mano? How are you? I'm blessed. blessed How are you feeling words. today? Yeah, awesome. You on the road this weekend? Every weekend, yeah. Uh, it's back to the grind. We're trying to make up for what we lost last year, plus new added dates for this year. So I'm pretty busy. Yeah. You're out the whole summer? Yeah, summer up until December, right right before Christmas. No shit. Yeah, yeah. Good for you, Rudy. How you feeling? <laughs> as, as long as things don't change. <laughs> right, yep. Yep. Yeah, and it don't look good, yeah. you know. The numbers yeah. are going up. Yeah, I don't know if they're tricking you or they want people to vaccinate themselves or whatever the fuck they're doing, but people are already starting to panic a little bit. I'm okay. Yeah. You know, what the fuck are you going to do? Yeah, you know? me too. Yeah. So what's going on, buddy? I miss you. I miss, I miss you getting, too. Fucking 11 like months. Porto, you know, I miss that. I miss going to Porto's too. You know, I've been here 11 months. I haven't eaten Cuban food yet. <laughs> it's such a fucking pain in the ass to get the way you need to go to get Cuban food that it just sucks. And once you're there, you can't find fucking parking. You know, you got to fucking walk two miles, so forget it. It's just too rough. I got to go to Union City in a couple of weeks anyway, so I'll fucking go early and park the car on 48th street and walk around a little bit and see how much it's changed yeah i well first of all you look amazing man you so look do you, unbelievable brother. you look so the you. best i've seen you. you your face you look happy yeah you look you look rested you know awesome awesome i am fucking rested uh, 11 months i've been resting that's a good fucking rest. That's longer than fucking Tommy and Goodfellas. Remember when he was resting out by the bus stop in Sea Caucus? I'm worse than him. I've been fucking resting up a storm. I sleep good, Rudy. 
I fucking take everything I can to fall asleep, the melatonin, the the THC, the CBD. I sleep <laughs> fucking solid. I get up to piss at four in the morning. I don't even know where the fuck I'm going. I end up in the closet <laughs> some days. My wife tells me I got up in the middle of the night to pee. I don't remember shit. <laughs> so I'm good, man. But I'm happy. You look great. I miss you. I feel good. I, I feel good. You yeah. know, I miss like 10 yeah. fucking dudes yeah. with all my heart. I miss Brett. I yeah. miss you. I miss a lot of people. But it's good that we have Zoom. We could connect now. We could do a little fucking yeah. podcast. I could call yeah. you next week and do your little radio show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I wanted absolutely. to talk to you about today was because you were old school, more old school than I am. You were born there. You walked around there. I was born there, but I got yanked out of there before I knew anything that was fucking happening. Talk to me about the Cuban situation as you see it. Well, listen, as I see it is uh, because I was there when it began. And my only, uh, you know, what took so long? That's my only question. <laughs> you know, I've been gone for 60 years. What has it taken since the revolution came in 62 years to people figure out that communism is not the way to go, especially after the cradle of communism, Russia, Karl Marx writing his book, you know, Lenin, all, you know, all of them. And it fell. Communism fell in, in Russia. So isn't that a clue that this thing does not work? You know, you cannot turn humans into robots, which is why communism, socialism, fascism, any dictatorship, a dictatorship, I don't care if it's left, right, middle, up and down, behind you, whatever, it's going to turn you into a robot. We are not robots. We're human beings. And eventually we get to a breaking point. Okay. If you take away everything from us, you're going to take fear away from us. And when we got no fear, we got nothing to lose. It, nothing, not, nothing else matters but freedom, you know? And I think that's what's going on right now. People are just fucking, they've had enough, the Cubans. They've had enough. You know, I know, I don't know firsthand, but I know from talking to my cousins what it's like down there. You know, they're well off. They're part of the revolution. They're well off. They're commies, you know. They have money. They have their bands. They have all that stuff. But I've spoken to other people that have told me what's going on down there, and it's not fucking good. It's it's just inhumane. And it's been like that for years, and we know that. You know, yeah. in the 70s, they turned our family on us. They tried to turn yeah. the yeah. family on you. So, yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh, it's a fucking brainwash, mind fuck, Scientology class all in itself. I mean, it's just a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's Spanish Scientology fucking Cuba. Yeah. yeah. Now we're left in this position that Cubans in America feel like I feel like shit over this because I want to be involved, but I don't know where to start. Well, you listen, uh, it all started with Bay of Pigs, they're not being able to, to be involved. I mean, listen, even, even Castro Fidel started his revolution outside of Cuba. He went on, he returned, I believe it was Mexico, right? So he returned from Mexico with the, the, with the first wave of revolutionaries on that boat, the Gramma. You know, that's that's that boat. And it was just a handful of revolutionaries. So they started in El Oeste, in, in the West. Oriente, you know, recruiting uh, farmers. You know, Ben to say the Julio. That was that was, you know, happened out west. It didn't happen in the middle in in Havana, you know. So it it carried over, but it was an invasion of Cubans that started not in the island. It had origins outside. Right. But that's not allowed anymore since the Bay of Pigs. You know, I mean, for the people that... I was in Cuba. I was uh, 10 years old. 10 years old when Bay of Pigs, 10 or 9. So I remember Bay of Pigs. My family was there during Bay of Pigs, and we left in the middle, and we were in Miami during the, uh, the missile crisis, the Cuban missile crisis, right? So I remember everything, you know? And I got to tell you, well, of course, you know, we didn't get firsthand information, 
in Havana, but we knew something was going on. There was a lot of mobilization going on, you know. And after, after it happened, you know, certain information came out. And then once I got to the United States, I got the other side of, of what also happened. So I put, you know, putting two and two together. But the thing was is that the La Brigada 2506, the brigade, which was the Cuban army that trained outside of Cuba to attack, you know, Fidel, they were the only ones that went in inland. The, 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 the U.S. Navy was held back. They were, they were ready to go. But Kennedy got a phone call from Khrushchev and says, if you guys, if, you, if the U.S. Navy attacks Cuba, you, you're starting World War III. So he backed down. So the brigade went in. They're the ones who flew in. You know, they had the airplanes and all that. And attacked Cuba. They were shut down. And check this out. Here I am, 10 years old, you know, before the revolution, just, you know, life was normal. I, you know, come home from school. I will watch cartoons, just like every other kid in just about every country, right? After the invasion of Bay of Pigs, they captured uh, Cuban soldiers that went in, right? And they, and all of a sudden, no more cartoons at that time. All it was, it was uh, the jury. You know, the judges, they had judgment, which meant that they were brought in. And this is on television, television. They were televised. They're bringing them in and they made the accusations. Next day, they had him shot. Shot on live TV. Fusila, fusilamiento. In live TV. Here I am a kid and I'm watching. I'm watching you know, man getting shot right live TV. Okay, this is this is what I experienced still living in Cuba, you know. And ever since uh, the Bay of Pigs, there has not, it's not, the, the U.S. government has not supported any invasion coming from the United States to Cuba. Now, when they went down there, 2506, that was the crew that Battle was in, Jose Battle. Yeah. And they got in. Castro was already waiting for them. He yeah. had put knives standing upside down in the ocean. So when they stepped, they would cut their feet. They knew they were set up. The United States, the, the Bay of Pigs guy that trained, they trained supposedly in northern New Jersey too. Because mm. Fidel started his campaign up here in Union City. Then he took it to Tampa. Then he took it to Mexico and he built, you know, he built up as he went along, you know? Yeah. If you yeah. remember in the movies in New Orleans, they said that, uh, fucko, the guy that shot Kennedy was passing out flyers. He was anti-communist for a while. Then he was communist. It was like, he was like a fucking setup, but Castro started his recruitment. You're right. In the United States, it started in Union City. He went somewhere else, New York City, Tampa, and then Mexico, and then he fucking took the grandma in, and that was it, the end of that fucking mm. tune. So Yeah. And then after they got captured, like Battle, Battle didn't get shot, and he remembers them getting saved, and they got taken to the Orange Bowl. And there at the Orange Bowl... Kennedy gave a speech, but his wife stole the show. Jacqueline said some shit that really got to the fucking soldiers. And, but under their breath, they all knew that Kennedy had fucked them. They knew that Kennedy had fucked them, you know. So that's the history there. But what I don't know is the question you ask yourself. How could they stay like that? For years, I've been saying, how can communism be alive and kicking 90 miles from the United States? It's fucking disgusting. It's just an embarrassment. Now, I don't think it's the United States fault with the embargo. You know, people are blaming the United States. They want Biden to fucking go in. I mean, a couple of days ago when we spoke, yeah. I was telling you that I think Sunday night, there was 3,000 Cubans in front of the White House. 
you know, they're starting to go in front of the White House now, and I think that's a great move, but I don't see, you know, the United States has their hands tied, Rudy. You know, I don't know if Russia would stick up for Cuba now. I don't know if China would stick up for Cuba. The way fucking Russia's been acting the last couple of years, this could also be a setup. This could also be a Russian setup. You know, Cuba's been acting fucking weird the last couple of years. Remember a couple of years ago, they had the all the people from D.C. went down there and they started getting headaches? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. Fidel and his people were yeah. doing some type of ring to- noise that it's like a dog whistle. You can't fucking hear it. Certain people's ears hear it. And all those people got fucked up. They had nausea. You know, Cuba's been acting fucking weird lately. So something's going on down there. But I think it's the Russians just trying to be high-handed. You never know. Never know. Never know. I mean, the only thing that I can give you, you know, my perception based on my own experience from being there, you know, uh, and also in school, you know, our education in school, especially pre-revolution was, you know, we, we were taught the basics. I learned at a very early age about the Spanish American war, you know, it, uh, do you, have you heard about El Maine, the Maine? It's a ship called Maine. No. Okay, this is, well, well, well Spain, well, well, Cuba was still a colony of Spain, right? And the Cubans were trying to, you know, get get up, just like the United States did with England, you know, stop being a colony break, and free, become a, a, a nation, you know, a country. And, uh, but the Sp- you know, they, they, they just couldn't fight the, the, the Spanish Armada, basically the army, you know, so, so what they knew, they knew that somehow they had to bring in the United States, you know, to help them. So there's conspiracy theories about this, that the boat, the ship, the American ship that was docked at Havana Bay, this is, I'm talking about 1899, right before, 1902 is when Cuba officially became a country so it's pre-1902 over 100 years ago right so this american ship was parked was docked right there in the uh, havana bay and somehow it blows up there's there's theories about that it was the spanish that did it but there was theories that the cubans did it to blame the spanish so eventually what happened is teddy roosevelt the rough riders came down, the Battle of San Juan Hill, along with, with, with the Cuban farmers. You know, the word guajiro? Yes. It's actually war hero, war hero. That's what the Americans were calling the farmers. The farmers. War, and they thought it was guajiro, right? So the farmers are, got involved. They became part of the... Uh, of the, of the army. It was like, you know, it's, it's called the Spanish American war, but it's really the Cubans were fighting along with the Americans against the Spanish, you know, and eventually, you know, they got uh, liberated and as a gift, as a thank you, as a thank you to the United States, Guantanamo, that territory that is the base was given to the United States, one time when what is known today as Guantanamo Base, as a thank you for liberating Cuba from the Spanish. That's fucking amazing. I never knew that. I had no yeah, idea. Well, they teach you that in school. They or well, they used to in Cuba when I was a kid. You know, so that's like fundamental stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't learn much about Cuba. It's what I read. You know, what I read on my own that I learned about Cuba, and I'm I'm upset that. I didn't ask more questions when my mom and dad were alive. Well, my mom was alive. You know, I was raised very anti-Castro. I was raised in a community that was very anti-Castro. I saw the fucking rage in their faces. You know, some people say, ah, Joe's a jerk off. But some people look at you and they go, Joe's a fucking cock. I mean, people would lose their mind when I was a kid. I didn't know what this hatred was about, so I had to actually read, look it up, and go, holy fuck. These fucking people had a hatred in their heart that was 
just rough. My mother, there was a lady at that was a bartender at my mother's bar that she would make me rub her head every day. She would tell me, rub, rub, rub my head. And I could feel, she would make me rub her head so I could feel the metal bullet she had in her head. She was pregnant and she passed a, like a stop in Cuba and they fired on her. And she still had the fucking bullets floating around her head. I mean, you could feel them in her head. I mean, just the shit that I was told was just... It was just horrible what they did to these people, you know? So this has been ingrained in their fucking psyche for years. A lot of those pre-revolutions, people are dead. I mean, thank God you still have your mom. She's still alive. But I bet your mom would be a fucking great guest to tell you exactly what the fuck was going on down there, you know? Yeah, but it's painful. It's painful to go there. No, it's very painful. You know? Yeah, very painful. It's very painful. They got everything taken from them. They got lied yeah. to, and then they got fucked. How would you feel? You know, how would you feel? I mean, they they got fucked. They got everything taken away from them. Well, let me tell you this: it took my family about a year to get all the documentation and visas and passports and and you know purchased a ticket, all of that, and it was done clandestine. Because if any, if we had defense committees which mean it was a, every block had a, a watch. It would be people watching you, watching your every move that you made. And if they found out something about you, they will report it. And then you were, you were, you, you disappear. That's it. They take you away and you never heard of me after that. Uh, to, to leave everything behind, knowing that, you cannot give it to any of your relatives, pass it on to your mom, you know, to, to, to my grandmother, nothing. We left the house. As a matter of fact, we were not even dressed to, to leave the country. By that meaning that back in 1961, it's going to be 40 years in September that we left. 60 years, 60 years that we left in September. And 1961. And we, we, you know, we just had like street clothes back. Back in 1961, people dressed up to go on a plane. You know, you had to wear a suit and a tie, you know, not like it is to it now. But, you know, back then. So we left like, you know, normal street clothes. And then somewhere along the way, we changed into our flying, you know, traveling clothes. And we had things in duffel bags. They call it chorizo, sausages, duffel bags, not even suitcases because we could not walk around with suitcases. If you purchase a suitcase, man, you were going somewhere. Where are you going? You start getting questions. You start, and if you have multiple suitcases because everybody in the family has got one or two, then that really raises the flag. So everything was done like, you know, in a duffel bags. So you can fold them up and put them inside of a paper bag. And nobody knew that what you were carrying, you know. So in, in the middle of the night before, before dawn, we, we uh, got in a car. We headed towards the airport you know we changed uh, on on our way there and i gotta tell you to you know that there is no coming back see if you're an immigrant you can always go back to your country but if you're a refugee a refugee you're running away and you're getting away from 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 a dangerous lifestyle something that takes away your freedom you're not going to come back until that problem is resolved, if ever, in your lifetime. And we knew that. And that's the anger that we all have. We had no closure. We cannot even say goodbye to our family. They didn't know. One day they go, where are they? And we are in Miami, gone. And, and, and there's no texting, no cell phones back then, 61. So the information trickles by writing a letter. To somebody to give to to somebody in my, in my family, because they were watching the postman to see you know if and and if and if it's a letter coming from from Miami to let's say my grandmother, they were gonna they were gonna grab it and read read what was in the letter, what information, and not even give it to 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 my grandmother. You know, it was it's horrible. Horrible, horrible situation. 60 years ago, can you imagine what it's like right now? I can't even wrap my head around that. You know, my wife told me yesterday that my cousin got a tweet out. 
about a week ago, my cousin Emmy. And it said that she didn't really want to tweet or say anything because she didn't want to get thrown in jail. They're just throwing people in fucking jail right now. Part of me wants to start some fucking problems up here. But I also feel that maybe they'll do something to your family in Cuba. Who the fuck knows if I start taking it to Twitter and Instagram and fucking marching and, you know, cursing fucking Fidel. I don't know what they're going to fucking do. You know, if you watch the 30 for 30 about the Duque brothers, the one that the two brothers that played Major League Baseball, that one World Series. El yeah, Duque, Duque, yeah. El Duque, what El Duque went through when his brother left was rough. They wouldn't let him play baseball because of his brother. They would throw eggs at his fucking house every day. You know, they would cut the food at his house because his brother left. You know, he had no choice but to fucking swim to fucking Bahamas. And then the Yankees got him from the Bahamian jail before they got thrown back in Cuba. If you ever get a chance to watch that 30 for 30, you'll be moved to fucking tears. It's, it's, it's tremendous. I thought it was one of the best ones. But just to see the way they live, you know, people don't know about the biggest star in Cuba, Celia Cruz. Fucking Fidel yanked her house. You know, Fidel wanted, Fidel got pissed because she didn't sing, when she was singing, she didn't make eye contact with him. She wouldn't look at that motherfucker, you know, because she knew he ended up killing her cousin. He ended up taking a house. He destroyed fucking Celia Cruz, you know. And a lot of people don't know this shit. But we don't. We know what's going on down there. And it hurts. You know, it bothers me. But what can you do? Where do you fucking start, Rudy? What do we do? If you send money, they take 70% now. You send $5, your family gets a dollar fucking yeah. 50 Yeah, yeah. You well, send you food, know, well, they take it off the top. You send medicines, they take some off the top, you know. You send a bottle of aspirins, they get three fucking aspirins. Yeah. yeah it's it's just a, yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. One thing about the the consciousness that the communist, you know, communism in Cuba has spread is the that that all their problems stem from the embargo. And you and I know. That if we walk into Walmart, everything's made in China. China, a communist country. What keeps Cuba from buying from China? We have no, no say so in that. Cuba has, has done business with every other country in the world. What, once the embargo, if ever, is lifted, and hopefully it's lifted after Cuba is liberated, Cuba will become a favorite nation, which means that we start pumping money into Cuba, meaning yours and mine tax dollars that we pay starts going back to the Cuban government, not to the people, but to the Cuban government because it's still a communist country, right? So lifting the embargo. See, people are not rebelling because there's no food. People are rebelling because they have no freedom. You can't buy freedom. doesn't matter how much money we send to Cuba, there'll still be prisoners in that island. Which is fucking crazy to me. It's crazy that, like when my uncle went back, he said, he said he could stay at the hotel, but his family wasn't allowed to visit him. Yeah, I know. What kind of shit is that? That's apartheid. That's apartheid. And nobody connects it and say, oh boy, the, the people in Cuba are not allowed to enjoy their own native. Uh, no. Nothing. That's apartheid. A it lot is. of people don't know that, that they're not even allowed in that. Like, if I go to Cuba and stay at a hotel, my family's not allowed in the hotel. I know, I know. Especially I know. if they have dark skin. Especially yep. if they're dark skinned. So a lot of yep. people don't fucking know this shit that it's that racist, yeah. it's that fucking, uh, you know, bad to live off three eggs a month or whatever the fuck they live off, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's just a goddamn shame. And like I said, I wish I knew where to start. You know, I think talking about it, like what we're doing right now and people listening, this will educate a lot of people. I mean, you dropped some fucking knowledge today. I had no idea about the Wajitos and fucking mm -hmm. and, uh, Guantanamo Bay and whatnot. But I just don't know where to start. 
you know, I don't know where to fucking start, whether it starts on social media, whether it starts by us going to the nation's capital and marching, you know, I don't know where to start. And I don't want to bring harm to the family that I have in Cuba. Yeah, you know, the reason why why I'm 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 not elated, elated that this is happening is because there's going to be a, a lot of bloodshed and most likely you're going to get the same result as in Venezuela, which is nothing, nothing happened. They, they rebel in Venezuela, you know, a couple of years ago and still, still the people are going through very hard times. And listen, any communist country, especially in the Caribbean, South America, with such fertile agricultural resources, Cuba in particular, coffee, tobacco, sugar cane. And of course, you're not, you're not going to survive only on those products. But when I'm talking about how fertile the land is to be able to export all of this around the world, if you really want to sustain your, your, your citizens, Agriculture, there is food, there's food there. But recently I've been watching interviews with farmers and the system is broken. They sit there because they, the farmers have to sell the, the, uh, their crops to the government. But the problem they're having is the government is not buying their crops. They're letting the crops rot. So they're sitting there with rotted crops and they can't sell that crop because you know they have to. That's that's allocated for the government. It's it's crazy what's going on there. Crazy. I just don't know what to do, Rudy, and that's what's yeah. eating me alive. You know, I will start with this, yeah. talking about it. You know, letting people know what's going on down there. I think you know, I've always cared, but I just didn't know where the fuck to start. Yeah. And I know this has to be, I mean, we could come up with money, get some boats, go down there and save some people, but there's a million people that want to get the fuck out of there right now. I know, I know. So, well, you know, unfortunately, what goes in comes out the same way. It's It began 62 years ago with a revolution, and it's going to go out with another revolution. That's from, from being there when that happened and my perception of what's going on now, it ain't going to change unless it's, re, it's a reversal. And the only way to, to do it is the same way that it, that it came in, the same way it's going to go out. So what do you suggest that somebody gets a little boat like grandma and starts in Mexico? I mean, listen, we have tons of fucking uh, Cuban Americans that are willing to help here. You know that this that those fucking Cubans are crazy. So what 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 do we do? Do we get boats and go down there? I mean, I don't think the United States is going to send anybody down there right now. No, no, of course not. I think no. we have our own fucking yeah. problems, and and I get it. I yeah. understand. Yeah. So this has to yeah. be like a a clandestine operation of Cuban Americans. Yeah. This is the only people that are going to take this over. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Historically, help, there's always been leadership. Like when during the Spanish American War prior to that, we had Jose Martí, leader. And he's just one one of many, you know, that were that were around. Maceo, Antonio Maceo, you know, all, all of these leaders who were either military or or conscientious leadership, you know. And I I don't see a leader right now. I see a mass revolt almost like the French Revolution. Just people fucking had it, you know, with it. But at the end of the day, once, when, God willing, things get resolved, there has to be somebody to come in and say, okay, we're going to place order. And it should be into internal, internal, you know, or at least Cuban, might be a Cuban in exile that comes in with the purest intentions. You cannot replace a bad system with another bad system. The next system that, that uh, government that comes into Cuba has to be saints. Saints, you know, like the best leadership 
any country could ever have. Otherwise, we have the same problem, but the uh, polar ops opposite, you know. Well, see, that's the problem I see, that I don't want somebody to go back in there with bad intentions again. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they're going to go up, they're going to come in and say they have mm -hmm. good intentions, but once they're there, the intentions become bad mm -hmm. again. Yeah. That's what I don't want Cuba yeah. to go through, like a bunch of Cuban-Americans from Miami that are fucking yeah. yahoos going down there and then yeah. it getting to their yeah. fucking head, you know. So that's what we... That's what I'm worried about. I hope this ends up like Marielle. I hope the government says, listen, you want out? Let's get the fuck out. Of it. Get the fuck out. Have your family come get you. Uh, send planes. I, I doubt the United States said they will not take Cubans. So they will have to go somewhere else. Oh, Mexico yeah. will take them. Canada will yeah. take them. You know, but I think it's going to be a mass exodus. I hope that's how it ends. Instead of all the bloodshed and the fighting yeah. and shit like that, yeah. that's what I'm hoping. Yeah, I, I, are you aware that it was Obama who lifted the the, the one wet foot, one dry foot? Yes. Law. Yeah, it was Obama. So now anybody that you know comes on a boat to Cuba, from Cuba, they get sent back, even even if they are if they are caught in in, in dry land, because that's you know they they're illegal. So send them right back. So that's why people are really not venture, you know, taking their, the, the risk of going, you know, on, on a boat or usually in a raft, not even a boat, a raft made out of like pieces of junk that floats and they throw themselves into the a shark infested Gulf, you know, with uh, hurricanes. I mean, the, the chances of survival are so minimal, but they rather risk their lives than to just uh, live, you know, live under, under communism. You know, I always think of that. What it takes, how bad is your life when I get in a raft in New Jersey to swim over to Long Island? That's that's the distance, you know, like the tip of Long 90 Island. Miles. Wow, 90 and miles. And probably wow. like the tip of Jersey. Like if I go all the way to Wildwood and yep. I get a fucking boat. I mean, how bad is your life? that you're willing to die yeah. on a fucking raft eating saltine crackers. Yeah. Because they have a system. Yeah. The Cubans have a system. They go from a certain part of the island. They leave at a certain time. You know, they have to bring in certain fucking things, water, saltines. You know, they bring a lot of shit. And then it's just a brutal 90 miles. It's There's no fucking clouds. You're in the fucking sun. If oh. you jump in the water, there's nothing but fucking sharks. I mean, it's a no-win-win situation. There's a no-win situation. So and, and, think of how bad your if, life has to be. I'm sorry? That is if, no, and that is if the Cuban Coast Guard doesn't get you and machine you, machine gun you, shoots you down. Because, wow. it, it, you know, if, if they see you, they're going to kill you. They kill children. They kill adults. It doesn't matter. You know, they see, they see a raft. The, you know, the Coast Guard, the Cuban Coast Guard. Right, yes. Right? So you have to, like, avoid that, too. So, you know, the risks are so high. It's have, you been to, have you been to the Raft Museum? There's no. a Rafter Museum. Oh, it's in Key West. To actually really? see these, it's, 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 it's pieces of junk with a rope together, and these people cross the goal from that. It's unbelievable. I wouldn't even go go in the swimming pool with one of these things. It's uh, it's very scary, and I'm happy that you brought all these things up today, so people know what the like. I said I I have a limited knowledge. You were born there. You were raised there. You were there for a couple of years under the fucking uh, yeah. maybe a year or two <laughs> under this shit. You know, I knew you would bring light to this, and I know I know yeah. how much it affects you. I still remember being at Porto's with you and saying to you, are you going to go to Cuba? And you're like, not in a million fucking years. Yeah, I, as long as that government's in there, I can't go back. And you were dead fucking serious. And I'm like, fuck, Rudy is no nonsense when it comes to this shit. But you never forgot. You were there. You saw the atrocities. 
you saw the lie hatching. You know, like when you go to Miami, yeah. you don't order a rum and coke. You order a mentirita. That means a lie. You know, that's what yeah. they called yeah. in Miami. They don't say rum and coke yeah. or whatever the fuck they yeah. called. They just say, yeah. give me a mentira. Mentira means a lie in Spanish. So yeah. it's, uh, it's just fucking crazy. Rudy, I hated to have you on for us to talk about this fucking nightmare in Cuba, but... I wanted to have you on to show people a different perspective, and you fucking came through on it. So you thank know, you. I, I, I've gotten a request to come on on other shows, and I'm making yours the only one because you and I, we know it's in our blood. We know this. We, we live this. You know what I mean? So it's not a, an opinion. It's just based on experience. Well, I, I, I never lived it, Rudy. I saw the pain. I saw the pain of it, of what it did to people. I saw the pain in my mother. I saw the pain in my stepfather. And I saw the pain in all those other Cuban Americans when I was growing up. And it did something to me. You lived it because, you see, we were just talking about what was going on in Cuba. Once you leave Cuba and you come to the United States, it's the other. It's, the, it's, it's, it's act two. Of, 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 the, of the nightmare. Act two, because all of a sudden, you know, I have met, you know, when I was living, when I was living in Cuba, I was Cuban, everybody else was Cuban. It didn't matter if they came from Poland during the, uh, you know, during the Nazis, or, or if there were Chinese leaving, you know, escaping from Mao Zedong, you know, it didn't matter, we were all Cubans. Then I come to the United States and it's like, well, you're different from everybody. And that guy is this thing and this guy is this other thing and everything. You know, once I moved to New Jersey, you know how West New York is, you know, especially in 1961. I was there in 63. That's when I got there, when Kennedy got shot. It was like you had your little section that had Italians and the Polish and then the Irish and then the Cubans. We were like, we were like the smallest minority in West New York, you know, not anymore, but that was it. And man, you know, I went from Rudolph, Rodolfo to Rudolph, and now I'm Rudy. The teacher's naming me Rudy first day in school. I never, I don't even know who, who he was talking to when he, when I was putting my books inside of my, uh, my desk. And he's, I hear Rudy, Rudy. I'm going like, then I lift my head and so say, it says, yeah, you. I go, no, Rudolph says, no, you're Rudy from now on. The adaptation, man, you know, losing your identity, losing everything. I'm, I'm talking about, a truth, my experience. Yes, I survived it. I survived it and I, because I survived it and I experienced it, yeah, I'm probably a better person than I would have been if, if I did not have these challenges. But it is challenging. Just because you leave communism, that doesn't mean like, okay, wow, this is fantastic. Okay, so now it's smooth sailing. Oh, no, man, it's, it's still a rough ride. It's rough, Rudy, and I don't know how to fucking uh, get this started, but it starts with you today. I mean, I'm happy that you took the time to let these motherfuckers know what's going on down there. Anytime. Anything for you, mi mano. Anything. anything. How are you doing, my friend? May, maybe someday we can do the podcast de La Habana. <laughs> I'll be there that? with you. <laughs> That'll be fucking great, man. That would be great, Rudy. <laughs> what else is going on in your world? The wife is good. Touring is good. Hey, everybody, I'm I'm blessed. Uh, touring, doing some shows with the guests here. I have I have a big announcement coming up uh, next week, and uh, I'm I'm blessed beyond words. Blessed beyond words. Yeah. Well, I yeah. miss you with all miss my you fucking too, heart, man. Miss you, too. Uh, you know, I miss going to lunch with you, and I miss just seeing you. You know, I'm six doors down from Florentine. We I always <laughs> talk about you. I saw him this morning at the gym with his son, and he always says that you're the reason why he had that son because you told him fucking to get it together and shit. So I saw him this morning with his son. It was great to see him, and uh, it's great wow. to see you, Rudy. And let's keep in touch about this Cuban thing. You got it. You got it. Your money. And yeah, how we could uh, help. You know, I don't want to send money to some fucking thing. I don't want to do that. I really want to. Yeah. Yeah. be involved you know so uh let me know yeah. and thank you maybe this week are you leaving this week yeah i'm leaving tonight actually i'm, I'm going oh, that's to right. my mom you're going to miami with mom yeah okay and then you're going on the road from there 
I'm going uh, straight from Miami. I'll be going to Port- somewhere in, in Maine, or outside of Portland. <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna next- be I'm gonna be at the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City coming up in September. So if you're not gigging, let's do it. Really? Come and come on down. Yeah. Yeah. What's the date? I got it on my calendar. I'll, I'll text it to you. Okay. I'll text yeah, it yeah. to you. What was I gonna say to you? Uh, fuck. There was something I had to tell. Oh. Maybe next week we could do another guitar lesson. Okay, you got that it. That was Let really, you scared the Let shit out of me that day. Why? I swear, to, I've Why? never seen you like that. I have like to tell what? you, I've never seen you like that, but all the pieces came together. Do you know that that was the last time I took a Xanax, the day I took the guitar lesson from you? And before that, it had been like three months since I took a Xanax. You were so intense on that guitar lesson. That I was like, fuck, I've never seen this side of Rudy. Put your thumb down, finger up, guitar out, <laughs> put your shoulders up. Holy shit. And now I don't use my thumb, and now the thumb is behind that. The pressure is tremendous. So that was, I was with you, and I'm like, I remember getting off with you and going, no wonder he's the bass player that he is. No wonder why he should be in the fucking Hall of Fame. Holy fuck. That was a guitar yeah. lesson. Right in front of you, I was like, huh! I had to fucking take a little football. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is as intense as can be. <laughs> so, yeah, let's get together next week. I'm doing crazy train for you. All right. So I don't have the whole thing. I just got I'm the boo 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 I just got that shit. I'm no fucking Randy Rhodes. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying, brother. But thank you very much. I hope this okay, Cuban thing man. works out. And uh, let's talk next week when you get back. You got it. God bless you. I love you, you, brother. God bless you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, you bad motherfuckers. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed Rudy Sarzo. I did. I learned. I didn't know about Guaido. I didn't know about Guantanamo Bay. I knew about the Spanish-American War, but I never knew all those little details he dropped on me. Thank you very much for enjoying it. Again, I'm very sorry about Monday's podcast. I was a little fucking lost with the therapy and whatever. It happens. I'm getting back now, guys. I have a plan. Uh, I'm going to start doing guest sets pretty soon. I feel it in my balls. Once my two fucking uh, stitches heal up, I'm going to just start. I got to get out of the house at night. I got to do a little something. I'm going to do it my way, though. I'm going to do comedy my way. I'll probably end up getting a residency around here. And I'll do comedy on Wednesday nights and Friday nights only. I want the weekends at home with my daughter. Uh, No more running around the fucking country. If I do go across the country, it'll be one fucking night to a theater. You know, I miss Milwaukee. I miss Cleveland. I miss Chicago. I miss Utah. I miss fucking Texas. I miss a lot of fucking states. You you guys know I've been on the road for fucking 20-something years. I know this whole fucking country back and forth, and I love it. You know, these fucking jerk-offs. Oh, I went went to Spain. Fuck you. You ain't going nowhere now with COVID. So you better get fucking cozy and get to know West Virginia, bitch. (laughs) You better get to know fucking uh, Fargo, North Dakota. You better get to know South Dakota because ain't nobody traveling abroad, and this is the way to go. Wyoming is a great state. Montana is a great state. Watch the show with Kevin Costner. My, My brother was telling me about it the other night. Some show from fucking Montana, there's more millionaires in Montana and New York City. I don't know what the fuck he was talking about. Do not forget, laughing gas is still, there's a little bit left until the fucking uh, next batch. So if you're in Studio City, stop by the ice cream fucking dispensary, the ice cream shop dispensary. Tell them Uncle Joey sent you, and they'll take great care of you. I love you. Thank you very much for supporting, and thank you for still being here. I'll see you Monday morning, Tip Top Magoo. And now for a word from our motherfucking sponsors, Jack. All right. I want to thank you guys. I want to thank Rudy. But I want to thank our sponsors that are the best. The joint is brought to you by Bowl and Branch. Tremendous sheets. There's nothing more important than a good night's sleep. You got to have nice sheets. Bowl and Branch sheets are ultra soft. Check out the signature hem sheets. They're best sellers for a good reason. They get softer with every wash. These sheets are buttery soft and lightweight. It's perfect for all seasons. They come in a variety of colors and in every size from twin to California king. And like I told you earlier, Bowling Branch sheets are made by craftsmen who earn a fair living wage. These workers earn their pay and respect they deserve. All of Bowling Branch products are made using safe, 
fair conditions, not like other people we won't mention. Get ready for this. The Bowling Branch Guarantee. Enjoy any product worry-free for 30 nights. Look at You've been looking to get sheets. You've been looking for a, preg a present for Grandma, Uncle Joey, Pete, the neighbor. This is the way to go. They're going to love them. Plus, you have a product worry-free for 30 nights. To experience the best sheets you've ever felt, choose Bowling Branch. You can try them worry-free for 30 nights with free shipping and returns. My listeners get an exclusive 15% off your first set of sheets with promo code Joey at BowlingBranch.com. That's Bowl, B-O-L-L, -L, and Branch, B-R-A-N-C-H. Dot com. Use promo code Joey. You're going to love these sheets. I like the guarantee they make you because you're going to fall in love with them. That backs what they're telling you right now. So go to BowlingBranch.com. Use promo code Joey and get the best sheets you ever felt in your life when you choose Bowling Branch. The joint is also brought to you by CBD Lion. I don't know how many times I got to tell you about these guys, but they're tremendous. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have made it out of the surgery. The tape, the bath balls, the cream, it's just, they're just tremendous. The gummy bears and the new ones they have have melatonin in them, so you're going to sleep like a baby. You have the roll-on, you got the CBD weed. When it comes to CBD, CBD Lion is the best available source to you. Read up on their website. Look at the third-party lab results. You won't be sorry. CBDLion.com slash Joey for 20% off. I want to thank Manscaped. I want to thank CBD Lion. I want to thank Bowling Branch. I want to thank all of you. It's Upstar. Everybody who, who sponsored our podcast. But I also want to thank you guys for watching and listening and for always supporting us. Have a great fucking weekend. We'll be back Monday morning. Tip top motherfucking Magoo. I love you, savages. <laughs>